Happy Wednesday, Mount members and friends. We are so glad that you have decided to join us for week seven of our Soul Care and African American Practice Bible Study. Today, we're going to be talking about some mothers and widows of the movement. And we're glad that you've joined us. And we ask that you help us by inviting others to join, whether it is on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Or you can have somebody call in at 804-203-9011. We believe that this is good information that others can benefit from. After this video, we ask that you would join us live on Dialpad by calling 804-203-9011 or downloading the app Meetings by Dialpad or going to meetings.dialpad.com forward slash SMZBC. All right, let's get started. Before we introduce you to mothers and widows of the movement, I do want to call your attention to the story of Hannah that is going to be used to center us today. Her story is told in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'm going to give you a quick synopsis, but you are encouraged to read it on your own. Elkanah had two wives because that was allowed back then. In describing the two women, the author simply says Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Already you can tell that a woman's worthiness was tied to her ability to bear her husband's children. But the story goes that Elkanah didn't hold Hannah's barrenness against her. In fact, it says that each year after making a sacrifice, he was sure to give Hannah a double portion because he loved her. But in the household, Penina would do things to irritate Hannah and remind her that she couldn't have children. So much so that Hannah would be sad and refuse to eat. Her husband would ask, don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? She didn't answer, but we know that even if Hannah's husband loved her and he didn't care about her ability to bear children, she lived in a society that looked down on her as less than, even though the scripture says it was God who had shut up her womb. So one day Hannah goes to present herself to the Lord. There she begins crying out to God, praying that God would bless her with a son and promising that if God did so, she would devote that child to God if God would only allow her to become a mother. Apparently, Hannah was praying silently, but her lips were moving. So when Eli the priest saw her, he assumed that she was drunk. She told him, no, I'm, I haven't been drinking, but um, I'm praying to the Lord for something very specific. And Eli told her, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of God. Fast forward to the new year and Hannah indeed becomes pregnant. And just as she promised, once she had weaned her son, Samuel, she brought him back to Eli, where she said, as surely as I live, I am the woman who stood beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give this child to the Lord for his whole life will be given over to the Lord. I believe that the women that we are going to discuss today made the same commitment. They gave birth to great men, but also offered them up to be used for the greater good. The first mother we want to introduce you to is Alberta Williams King, mother of Martin Luther King Jr. She was born in Atlanta in 1903, the only surviving child of Jenny Celeste Williams and Reverend Adam Daniel Williams. Reverend Williams was the pastor of Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church. Dr. King often spoke of the positive influence his mother had on his moral development, deeming her the best mother in the world. In a piece he wrote as a student at Crozer Theological Seminary, he described his mother as being behind the scenes, setting forth those motherly cares, the lack of which leaves a missing link in life. Mrs. Williams attended high school at the Spelman Seminary and earned a teaching certificate at the Hampton Normal and Industrial Institute, now Hampton University in 1924. Williams met Michael King shortly before she left for Hampton. After she completed schooling, Williams and King announced their engagement during Sunday services at Ebenezer. Because of the local school board did not allow married women to teach in the classroom. Did y'all hear that? Married women could not teach in the classroom. Williams taught only briefly before her marriage on Thanksgiving Day, 1926. After their wedding, the newlyweds moved into Alberta Williams' 
family home upstairs in the bedroom on Auburn Avenue. That's where Dr. King was born, along with his older sister, Christine, and his younger brother, Alfred Daniel. After the death of Reverend Williams in 1931, Michael King succeeded his father-in-law as Ebenezer's pastor and began using the name Martin Luther King Sr., changing his son's name to from Michael King to Martin Luther King Jr. Alberta Williams King followed in her mother's footsteps as a powerful presence at Ebenezer. She founded the Ebenezer Choir and was an organist there from 1932 to 1972. She continued her studies at Morris Brown College, receiving a BA in 1938. She was also an organist for the Women's Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention from 1950 to 1962 and was active in the YWCA, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. As a mother, Alberta worked diligently to instill a sense of self-respect within her three children. King remembered his childhood as one of harmony spent with parents who loved each other. King Jr. maintained a close relationship with his mother throughout his life. When he was in Connecticut on a tobacco farm where he worked during the summer while a high school student, he requested, Mother dear, I want you to send me some fried chicken and rolls. Four years later, as a first year student at Crozier, he wrote his mother, I met a fine chick in Philadelphia who has gone wild over the old boy. Although her soft-spoken nature compelled her to avoid publicity that accompanied her son's international renown, she remained a constant source of strength to the King family. And Mrs. King's strength was needed because on April 4th, 1968, while standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. He was pronounced dead one hour later. Mrs. King faced fresh tragedy the next year when her younger son and last born child, Alfred Daniel Williams King, who had become the assistant pastor after Martin Luther King, drowned in his pool. And the family was not left without tragedy because six years after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Mrs. King, often referred to as Mama King at Ebenezer, was shot and killed on June 30th, 1974 at 69 years old, a 23-year-old black man from Ohio who had adopted the theology of black Hebrew Israelites came into their sacred space. And while she was playing our father on the organ, he began shooting. She was killed along with one of the church's deacons. 10 years later, her husband, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. had a heart attack and died. They are buried together in Atlanta. The widow of Martin Luther King was born Coretta Scott on April 27, 1927 in Alabama. Coretta graduated valedictorian from Lincoln Normal High School and entered Antioch College in Ohio in 1945. She received a BA in music and education. She also attended Boston's New England Conservatory of Music where she earned a Bachelor of Music in music education. Mrs. King's musical background informed her work as an advocate for justice and peace. During the late 1950s, Mrs. King performed concerts and recitals throughout the South. She conceived and organized a series of freedom concerts as fundraising efforts to benefit the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Throughout the 1960s, these critically acclaimed concerts combined poetry, narration, and music to tell the story of the Civil Rights Movement. Coretta Scott met Martin Luther King Jr. in Boston, Massachusetts, where they were both attending the university. She was at the New England Conservatory and he was at Boston University. They married on June 18, 1953, and in September 1954, settled in Montgomery, Alabama, where Dr. King had been appointed pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Early on in their marriage, Coretta Scott King devoted much of her time raising their children. Yolanda Denise, Martin Luther III, Dexter Scott, and Bernice Albertine. She balanced motherhood and movement work. The King family home would often serve as a center of activity for the church and the movement. 
Mrs. King often participated in strategy meetings and provided feedback and encouragement to Dr. King as he prepared his sermons and speeches. She was concerned about freedom and justice around the world. And in 1957, she journeyed with her husband to Ghana, West Africa to mark that country's independence, also visiting Nigeria, France, Italy, and the Vatican. In 1959, Mrs. King spent nearly a month in India with Dr. King on a pilgrimage to visit followers and sites associated with Mahatma Gandhi. In 1964, she traveled with her husband to Oslo, Norway, where he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. Following Dr. King's death on April 4th, 1968, Mrs. King acted upon her vision to preserve the places, writings, speeches, and sermons, as well as the works associated by him. And she did this by creating the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change Incorporated, commonly referred to as the King Center. In 1974, Mrs. King formed a broad coalition of over 100 religious, labor, business, civil, and women's rights organizations dedicated to a national policy toward full employment and economic opportunity. She served as co-chair of both the National Committee for Full Employment and the Full Employment Action Council. In 1983, she brought together more than 800 human rights organizations to form the Coalition of Conscience. During this march, the primary legislative focus was on the passage of the King holiday, which Mrs. King worked tirelessly for. She considered that one of her greatest legacy contributions, spearheading the massive educational and lobbying campaign to establish Dr. King's birthday as a national holiday. One of the most influential African-American leaders of her time, Mrs. Coretta Scott King received honorary doctorates from over 60 colleges and universities. She authored two books, edited a compilation of selected quotes by Dr. King, maintained a nationally syndicated newspaper column, served on and found dozens of organizations, including the Black Leadership Forum, the National Black Coalition for Voter Participation, and Black Leadership Roundtable. Mrs. King died on January 30th, 2006. She was the first woman and first African-American to lay in honor in the rotunda of the Georgia Capitol. A few days after her death, thousands of people paid their respects in the sanctuary of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. In the writings of Dr. King, you will find words of appreciation and adoration for both his mother and his wife. Undoubtedly, he was able to do all that he did because of these strong black women who loved him unconditionally. Next up, we have Louise Norton Little. Louise was born on May 9th, 1897 to a young woman named Ella. Ella was the daughter of Jupiter and Mary Jane Langdon, both of whom were kidnapped by other Africans from the region of modern day Nigeria and sold into slavery before being freed by the British Royal Navy and transported to Granada. Some historians believe that Louise's mother became pregnant after being raped by a significantly older Scottish man. Louise was educated in a local Anglican school. After her grandparents died, she immigrated to Montreal, Canada, where her uncle Edgerton introduced her to Marcus Garvey's philosophy, and she became a part of his organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, also known as UNIA. Through the UNIA in Montreal, Louise met Earl Little, a craftsman and lay minister from Georgia. The couple married in 1919. The following year, they moved to Philadelphia, then to Omaha, Nebraska. While in Omaha, she became the secretary and branch reporter of the UNIA's local chapter, sending news of local events led by Earl to Negro World, which was the organization's paper. Louise was very active in Garvey's movement, but as a woman, she could receive little credit. However, her son does remember that she would receive letters from the leaders of the movement, thanking her for the work she had done and praising her for her devotion to the cause. Earl and Louise had seven children together. As parents, the Littles instilled self-reliance and black pride in all their children. Because of Ku Klux Klan threats, the Littles relocated in 1926 to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and shortly thereafter, Lansing, Michigan. The family was frequently harassed by the Black Legion, which was a white racist group. In 1931, Earl died in what was officially ruled 
a streetcar accident, though Louise believed Earl had been murdered by the Black Legion. After a dispute with creditors, Louise received a $1,000 life insurance benefit in payments of $18 per month. The issuer of a larger policy declined to pay, refusing to do so, claiming that her husband had committed suicide. To make ends meet, Louise rented out part of her garden and her sons hunted for game. During the 1930s, there were some white Seventh-day Adventists who came to witness to the little family and Louise, along with one son, were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church. In 1937, a man Louise had been dating vanished from her life when she became pregnant with his child. Heartbroken, she gave birth to her eighth child, Robert, in 1938. After what some would call harassment by welfare workers, Louise Little was committed to Kalamazoo State Hospital. Her children were separated and sent to foster homes. She was institutionalized from 1939 through 1963. 1939 to 1963. Professor Eric McDuffie shared this quote. Louise Little was a brilliant and dynamic woman not some crazy or apolitical figure as she is often portrayed in the scholarship about Malcolm X. She was a committed Garveyite grassroots activist. She spoke multiple languages, English, French, Patois. She taught her children the French alphabet. She insisted that her children read newspapers such as the Negro World and newspapers from her homeland. What most intrigued me was her resilience, McDuffie says. She was institutionalized at the Kalamazoo Mental Hospital all those years, but she lived almost 30 years after her family got her out of that hospital. Her time in that hospital can be viewed as a form of incarceration because the state targeted her because she was proud, she was independent, she owned her own land, and she refused to bow down to white supremacy and the patriarchy. For these reasons, she was placed in that hospital. Her land was taken away from her and her children were put in foster homes. Despite being hospitalized for 25 years though, she survived, end quote. Her children, including Malcolm X, fought for her release because they didn't believe their mother was mentally ill. And less than two years after returning home, her son was assassinated. Louise never forgot who she was. She remained strong and she lived with her surviving children and descendants until she died in 1989. Betty Dean Sanders was born on May 28, 1934 to a teenage mother. While Betty spent most of her childhood in Detroit, she may have been born in Georgia, but no birth certificate has ever been located. By most accounts, Betty was abused by her biological mother, so at the age of 11, she was taken in by businessman Lorenzo Malloy and his wife, Helen. Helen Malloy was a founding member of the Housewives League of Detroit. This was a group of African-American women who organized campaigns to support Black-owned businesses and boycott stores that refused to hire Black employees. She was a member of the National Council of Negro Women and the NAACP. The Malloys were active members in the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Despite their activism, the Malloys sheltered Betty from racism. If you remember what Pastor Nelson said about Diane Nash's grandmother, the Malloys had the same philosophy. Betty wrote in 1995, race relations were not discussed in the home and it was hoped that by denying the existence of race problems, the problems would go away. Anyone who openly discussed race relations was quickly viewed as a troublemaker. After high school, Betty left Detroit to attend Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which was her foster father's alma mater. She intended to earn a degree in education and become a teacher. In Alabama, Betty encountered racism in an extreme manner. As she settled into life in the Jim Crow South, nothing had prepared her for this racism. And so long as she stayed on campus, she could avoid interacting with white people, but weekend trips into Montgomery, which was the nearest city, would try her patience. Black students had to wait until every white person in a store had been helped before the staff would serve them. 
Betty's studies suffered as a result of her growing frustration and experience with racism. She decided to change her field of study from education to nursing, and the Dean of Nursing at Tuskegee encouraged her to study at a Tuskegee affiliated program at the Brooklyn State College in New York City. Against her foster parents' wishes, Betty left Tuskegee and traveled to New York. So she arrives in New York in 1953, and while less overt, the racism she observed in New York deeply affected her too. For example, at the hospital where she performed her clinical training, black nurses were given worse assignments than white nurses. White patients were sometimes abusive toward black nurses and management said nothing. Betty frequently wondered whether she had merely exchanged Jim Crow racism for a more genteel prejudice in the North. During her second year of nursing school, Betty was invited by an older nurse's aide to a Friday night dinner party at the Nation of Islam's temple in Harlem. The food was delicious, Betty recalled. After the dinner, the woman asked Betty to listen to a lecture. The speech, the nurse's aide invited her to join the Nation of Islam. And Betty politely declined. When the woman said, why? Betty said, because I didn't know that you brought me here to join an organization besides my mother speaking of her foster mother, would kill me. And additionally, I don't even understand the philosophy. You see, the Malloys were Methodist, and when she was 13, Betty had decided she would remain a Methodist for the rest of her life. But the nurse's aide was persistent. She told Betty about her minister, who was not at the temple during her first visit. She said, just wait until you hear our minister. He's very disciplined, he's good looking, and all the sisters want him. Betty enjoyed the food so much, she said, that she agreed to come back and meet the woman's minister. At the second dinner, the nurse's aide told her, the minister is here, and Betty thought to herself, big deal. But in 1992, she recalled how her demeanor changed when she caught a glimpse of Malcolm X. She said, quote, then I looked over and I saw this man on the extreme right aisle sort of galloping to the podium. He was tall, he was thin, and the way he was galloping, it looked as though he was going someplace much more important than the podium. He got to the podium and I sat up straight. I was impressed with him, end quote. Betty began attending Malcolm's services, and in 1956, she converted to Islam, changing her surname to X. The X represented the loss of her African ancestry. And although they had never discussed the subject, one day Malcolm called and asked her to marry him. And without hesitation, Betty said yes. They married on January 14th in Michigan. I found this interesting anecdote that talks about the relationship between Betty and Malcolm that I think sheds light on their relationship that we may not have known before. In the beginning, their relationship followed the Nation of Islam's strict rules concerning marriage. Malcolm set the rules and Betty obediently followed them. Betty said his indoctrination was so thorough, even to me, that it was the pattern for our family's lives. But over time, the family dynamic changed. And in 1969, Betty reflected on how Malcolm X made small concessions to her demands for independence. She wrote, quote, we would have little family talks. They began at first with Malcolm telling me what he expected of a wife. But the first time I told him what I expected of him, as a husband, it came as a shock. After dinner one night, he said, boy, Betty, something you said hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I've been going along, having our little workshops with me doing all the talking and you doing all the listening. He concluded our marriage should be a mutual exchange. The couple had six daughters, including twins who were born after his death. Betty and Malcolm left the Nation of Islam in 1964, changing their surname to Shabazz, and they became Sunni Muslims. A year later, on February 21, 1965, in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom, Malcolm X began to speak to a meeting of the Organization of Afro-American Unity when a disturbance broke out in the crowd of about 400 people. As Malcolm X and his bodyguards tried to quiet the disturbance, a man rushed forward and shot Malcolm in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two other men 
ran onto the stage and fired handguns, hitting Malcolm X 16 times. Betty was in the audience near the stage with her daughters. Malcolm had specifically asked that they show up on this day. When she heard the gunfire, she grabbed the children and pushed them to the floor beneath the bench where she shielded them with her body. Remember, she was pregnant at the time. And when the shooting stopped, she ran to her husband and tried to perform CPR. Police officers and Malcolm X's associates used a stretcher to carry him up a block to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Betty never remarried. She focused on raising her daughters. And after Malcolm was assassinated, she was financially strapped. She was aided by royalties from his book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And I found it interesting during my research that at first she was splitting half the royalties with Alex Haley, but after he published Roots, he signed over his portion of the royalties to Betty. And I found that Ruby D and Juanita Portier, who was married to Sidney Portier, established a committee of concerned mothers to raise funds to buy a house and pay educational expenses. The committee raised $17,000 and bought a large two-family home for the Shabazz family. In 1969, Betty completed her undergraduate degree at Jersey City State College. By the early 70s, she began giving public lectures on the African-American condition. Though she never challenged white supremacy like her husband, she fought for education and human rights causes in her own style. She earned her master's in public health administration in 1970, and then she went on to earn her doctorate in higher education administration at the University of Massachusetts. Betty accepted a position as an associate professor of health sciences at Medgar Evers College, and she worked as a university administrator and fundraiser there until her death. In June 1997, her 12-year-old grandson, Malcolm, set fire to her apartment. She suffered burns over 80% of her body and spent three weeks in intensive care before dying of her injuries. She was laid to rest next to her husband, whose name in the end was El Haj Malik Al Shabazz. And finally, Merle Louise Beasley was born March 17, 1933 in her maternal grandmother's home in Vicksburg, Mississippi. She was the daughter of a 16-year-old. Merle's parents separated when she was just a year old and she was raised by her paternal grandmother and aunt. Both women were respected school teachers and they inspired her to follow in their footsteps. Merle attended the Magnolia School, took piano lessons and recited poetry at school, in church and at local clubs. After graduating from high school in 1950, she enrolled at Alcorn A&M College, one of the few colleges in the state that allowed African-American students. She majored in education and minored in music. On her first day of school, Murley remembers meeting and falling in love with Medgar Evers. He was a World War II veteran, eight years her senior. The meeting changed her college plans and the couple married on Christmas Eve of 1951. They had three children during their marriage. When Medgar Evers became the Mississippi Field Secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1954, Murley worked right alongside him. She became his secretary and together they organized voter registration drives and civil rights demonstrations. She assisted him as he struggled to end the practice of racial segregation in schools and other public facilities. And as he campaigned for voting rights for many African-Americans who were denied this right in the South. For more than a decade together, Medgar and Murley fought for voting rights, equal access to public accommodations, the desegregation of the University of Mississippi, and for equal rights in general for Mississippi's African-American population. They were seen as prominent civil rights leaders in Mississippi, and they became high-profile targets because of that. In 1962, their home in Jackson, Mississippi was firebombed in reaction to an organized boycott of downtown Jackson's white merchants. The Evers family lived with the constant threat of death. The risk was so high that Murley and Medgar had trained their children on what to do in case of a shooting, bombing, or other kind of attack on their lives. 
In the early morning of Wednesday, June 12, 1963, just hours after President John F. Kennedy's nationally televised civil rights address, Medgar Evers pulled into his driveway after a meeting with NAACP lawyers. In the days leading up to this day, Evers had been followed home by at least two FBI cars and one police car. But on the morning of his death, none of his usual protection was present. The reason why FBI or local police have never given. There has been speculation that many members of the police force were actually members of the KKK. As Medgar Evers got out of his car, he was carrying NAACP t-shirts that read Jim Crow must go. He was struck in the back with a bullet that passed through his heart. Initially thrown to the ground by the impact of the shot, Medgar rose and staggered about 30 feet before collapsing outside his front door. His wife and children were in the home. He was taken to the local hospital in Jackson where he was refused entry because of his race. His wife explained who he was and eventually they admitted him, but he died in the hospital 50 minutes later. He was only 37 years old. Evers was the first black man to be admitted to an all white hospital in Mississippi. Medgar Evers was mourned nationally and he was buried in Arlington National Cemetery where he received full military honors before a crowd of more than 3,000. In 1976, Merle Evers married Walter Williams. Merle Evers Williams joined the board of the NAACP because by the mid-1990s, the prestigious organization was going through a difficult period marked by scandal and economic problems. She decided that the best way to help the organization that she loved and had committed so much time and energy to was to run for chairperson of the board. She won the position in 1995, just after her second husband's death due to prostate cancer. As chairperson of the NAACP, Merle Evers Williams worked to restore the tarnished image of the organization. She also helped improve its financial status and raised enough funds to eliminate their debt. After leaving her post as chairwoman, Evers Williams established the Medgar Evers Institute in Jackson, Mississippi. She wrote her autobiography titled Watch Me Fly, What I Learned on the Way to Becoming the Woman I Was Meant to Be. Ebony Magazine has named her one of the 100 most fascinating Black women of the 20th century, and she has received seven honorary doctorates. On January 21st, 2013, Evers Williams delivered the invocation at the second inauguration of President Barack Obama. She was the first woman and the first lay person to deliver the invocation at a presidential inauguration. Merle Evers Williams is still alive today, currently 88 years old, and tomorrow is her 89th birthday. The widows of Medgar, Martin, and Malcolm had a bond that most of us would not understand. The mothers of these men who had to bury their children also have a bond that few can fathom. But there is so much that we can learn from these mothers and widows about their strength and their resolve. It's all inspiring and encouraging to each of us that we might too endure the worst that life has to offer and still come out hopeful and full of faith. That's our lesson for today. We hope that you will please join us on Dialpad where you can answer the question, what did you learn about the women that we discussed in today's lesson? We're heading over to Dialpad. We hope that you will join us. If you're not going, just a few quick reminders. Join us for prayer tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. If you or someone you know is in need of food, you can meet us at the Mount from 1245 to 2 p.m. on Friday where we will be giving out groceries, fresh produce, fresh meat, fresh baked goods, and then worship on Sunday. Please note that pre-registration is no longer required. If you choose to worship in person, just come meet us at the Mount, 14 West Duval Street, Richmond, Virginia, 23220. Or we will also have worship online for those who choose to join us virtually. Thank you. See you on Dialpad in just a second.